Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today we're going to investigate the Asa Butterfield is Spider-Man headline that is currently on life support, less than 24 hours after it debuted online as sort of a social media and internet uh, movie news website bomb. But as quickly as it exploded, it also went away in one of the most aggressive rebuttals I've ever seen to one of these uh, internet breaking news stories about comic book movies. I mean, it's almost as if the uh, industry press, the Hollywood industry press, was like, enough is enough already, at least when it comes to Latino review. So why isn't this headline dead, right? It's been debunked by almost every major reputable uh, movie news source uh, that's, that's out there. Well, the reason it's not dead, and the reason that I think that Latino Review can play this game, and will probably continue to play it, is because the chances are 50-50 that he's right. Because everybody can agree that they've narrowed down the Spider-Man role, apparently, to Tom Holland from The Impossible, who I'm rooting for, and also Asa Butterfield of Ender's Game and Hugo. So there's still a chance that he could be right. And even if his story is totally incorrect and he has made this announcement with really no, uh, no credibility whatsoever, he could still be proved right in the long run, which then will reflect positively on this breaking news story, he'll be able to say, see, I was right, and live to report another day. He might be able to live to report another day anyway, because there's a very short-term memory when it comes to this kind of news coverage. But so how does a thing like this happen, right? Especially if he doesn't have any reputable sources. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, I've seen a couple of comments still about like, why are you covering so, covering so much comic book movie news? Well, comic book movie news currently is what drives the most internet traffic. It's by far and away what people are interested in hearing about. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like if you've seen Mad Max and you know you want to make the truck really go fast, as I'm sure when you see the movie you'll see, uh, that's kind of like what happens when you put comic book movie news in your engine. And every single uh, website, every single publication, no matter where they are in the, in the hierarchy of things in terms of I guess you could say credibility, views are important. V you know, nobody here is like a publicly funded uh, service. However, even those people care about ratings, as you see with PBS becoming very aggressive with their BBC uh, or well, overall, because it's also some of his ITV, but they're, they're British programming. So ratings matter. And also there's something to be said for giving people what they want. And the vast majority wants comic book movie news. So everybody's chomp. It's very slow right now. Nothing's happening. All right. As some of you have pointed out, it's because the TV upfronts are going on. Uh, also, we're in kind of a lull uh, in terms of uh, movie news and also movie things that are, movies that are coming out. Avengers already hit. There was a big, you know, storm of news and coverage of people trying to piggyback on that. Uh, you know, the excitement of that release, but now we're kind of like in a, a slow period of summer. You know, there are no big trailers debuting, a uh, Hot Pursuit didn't generate a lot of traffic, and also Pitch Perfect 2 and Mad Max aren't generating a ton of internet traffic, at least in this, uh, you know, this part of the internet with movie news. It might be doing like gangbusters over in the more, uh, let's say, femme-centric areas of the internet, but it's not driving any traffic. So we're all starving. We're all, you know, we're, we're dehydrated. We have nothing, you know, we have no nourishment. So when a story like this comes along, uh, everyone's like, oh my God, finally some views. It's like, you know, you feel like you might've hit oil or someone might've said, hey, there's oil over there and you'd be crazy not to drill, right? But I think a number of us, and this is why I didn't report it, have been burned too many times by a Latino review. I mean, the guy, I don't know who his source is, but it's really suspect. Now, I have reported rumors before, like with Joaquin Phoenix uh, and Doctor Strange, but that was reported by every single industry trade. That rumor had real credibility. And also, as we've all found out, it was true. And just Joaquin Phoenix walked away from it. He didn't want to be in the movie. And so that was a very embarrassing situation for Kevin Feige, but it was a situation where the rumor was true, and therefore that's why everybody reported it. But this is not true. Now you might say, well, if nobody reported it, why did it trend on Twitter? Well, here's the thing. There are a lot of small movie news websites. Uh, you know, they're not the big guns, you know, like uh, Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, The Wrap, uh, Entertainment Weekly to some degree. Uh, those sites, you know, they have a, they're like the upper tier, the top tier. But there are a lot of really small sites that to totally, you know, uh, are based their, their view traffic on search traffic. So as soon as a story like this breaks, 
you want to be the first to report it because the, the quicker you report something, the higher up you are in the search traffic. That's just the way the internet works. It's the way every search engine uh, works. It's the way even YouTube works. So it's really a speed game. So that's something because, you know, people click on one of the first headlines they see. And so that's also helped to shape the way uh, all news is covered these days, actually, not just entertainment news. So as soon as they see this report drop from Latino Review, everyone jumps on it. And they're like, quick, get this story up there, uh, even to report that there's a rumor that Asa Butterfield has been cast. Uh, and then we just, you know, we can change it. We can amend the headline. Let's just get in there and make sure people come to our site. So that's why this thing, to, to, as I said, um, to some degree exploded. Everyone just grabbed for it. It was like a feeding frenzy, right? Uh, a Latino review dropped an awfully nice piece of chum into the piranha-filled waters of what's become entertainment news. So how did it get debunked, right? I mean, he's done this before and no one has had this strong a rebuttal. Well, this is a major announcement. So I think what happened was that the major uh, Hollywood, uh, you know, industry trades who have I think a little bit more solid sources than Latino Review were like, wow, we're not covering this. Everyone's going to think we're not on top of things. So we need to shut this down so that people aren't surprised that we're not covering it. So they very quickly sent tweets out, uh, like throwing water on the fire. Uh, for instance, Entertainment Weekly said, my sources say that he is in talks, but definitely not uh, anywhere near signing. And then Variety said that he signed a contract to do a screen test. And it wasn't a contract to actually play the character. So I guess you can see what kind of secrecy they have going on at Marvel that you need to sign a contract to do a screen test. Maybe because they were going to show him parts of the script. Maybe he couldn't discuss what he did. Uh, maybe, you know, it's a precursor to a contract that might come about if they, if they sign, if they do decide to go with him. Who knows what the legal situation is over there. But that's how they were able to discredit this quite aggressively, you know. And so I think that that's really what happened yesterday. So if you're wondering, how did this story come about? How did it get so much traction? Then why did it disappear? Why did some people cover it? Why did they not? And so I guess you could say that to some degree, I covered it too, but I tried to cover it from a really, really credible and realistic point of view so that even though I think this, as I say, I'm saying the story is totally incorrect. Well, it's, it's incorrect now. I mean, as I said, there's a 50-50 chance that he's right. I think at least you learn something about how Entertainment news is reported these days so that you can be more savvy when you see a headline break. and You can do the, you know, the forensics work to decide how true it is. And, you know, I mean, still, we all like to hear these headlines. We like to know what people are talking about. But you, you, you can decide how much salt to sprinkle on it, how many grains of salt to sprinkle on it. All right, so that's the first story of the day. And I would be curious who you're rooting for between those two. I'm Tom Holland all the way. I think this, this whole thing is in a lot of trouble anyway. I don't think anybody wants to see Peter Parker in high school again. I think this is a major miscalculation. We'll see, though. Uh, and I think Age of Ultron proved that Kevin Feige is not in, in touch, untouchable and is not 100% batting record. So I think that this could be a really big embarrassment. But he could always pin it on Sony and be like, it was Sony's idea. I tried. I think that if they weren't going to go with Miles Morales, they should have gone with an adult Peter Parker. Uh, I just think the high school retread is just too much. But I'd be much more interested in it if it was Tom Holland. As I've said before, Asa Butterfield has been put before uh, the mainstream audience, and they have rejected him on multiple occasions. Hugo, uh, a a Ender's Game, none of these things have clicked. He's never become a name. He doesn't drive any search traffic. I think it's really a not a good choice. And while there are other people who've surprised us with Marvel properties and DC properties, mostly Marvel because DC is still building their empire and have to prove themselves, that's because those people came out of nowhere, like Tom Holland would. Tom Holland would be one of those choices that comes out of nowhere. But Asa Butterfield has not come out of nowhere. He's tried, he's failed, and, you know, three strikes and he's out, but I don't think Marvel and Sony want to be his third strike. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, talking about superhero news, something really extraordinary happened yesterday, for reals, uh, not some rumor from Latino Review. And this is that the CW got, I would say, as much attention for a property as a comic book movie did. Uh, usually does. And that's really, really commendable. And also, I think, a little scary for the superhero business at large. So what happened? Well, the CW had their upfront presentation, and they showed their first trailer for DC Legends of Tomorrow, which is basically going to be the CW's Avengers equivalent. It was amazing. I don't even like Arrow and the Flash, and I was blown away 
by this trailer. If you haven't seen it, there's a link down below in the video description, but it was really, really impressive. Uh, particularly, I would say, from a special effects and action perspective. This was very well done action and special effects uh, choreography, directing, etc., visual effects budget for the small screen. Now, I think it's still, uh, some of the interactions seemed very TV to me. Uh, it wasn't quite the level of, I think, what Marvel has accomplished with their, accomplished with their Netflix shows, where it's almost like, um, tele I mean, uh, movie quality. Uh, look at that, I'm mixing them up in my mind because they're becoming mixed up in everyone's mind, uh, TV and movies. But no, I think that Netflix got very close to movie quality with the Daredevil series. Uh, I think that, um, and I think the Daredevil and the Legends of Tomorrow could almost be, you know, like right up against each other, but uh, even though they're touching fingers through the fence, Daredevil's on the movie side and Legends of Tomorrow is still very much on the TV side. However, it got so much attention and was trending like all day on Twitter at the top of the trending list. It was amazing to behold. And Jeff Johns, who, by the way, I recently exchanged tweets with because I gave such high praise for uh, Batman Earth 1 Volume 2. If you're not reading his Batman Earth 1 Volumes 1 and 2, which are currently out, you are missing out, uh, but he's also very much involved in the C uh, CW initiative, which as I said yesterday when discussing Supergirl, that it's kind of become like, the CW is almost becoming like a DC network, which is working out wonderfully for them. But he was at this upfront and he said, yes, crossovers have been very beneficial for us. We're going to continue with them in a major way. This was his exact quote. He said, we do have crossovers planned. He's the um, chief content officer at DC. And Jeff John said, the point of building these three show shows out of the CW network is so we can make a comic book world. That's really the secret formula starting to emerge on television for the first time. And to answer your question, uh, he answered your question that Supergirl currently is not involved in this crossover situation. She might be down the line, but right now CBS is keeping her to themselves. As one of you pointed out yesterday, the CW and CBS are, um, you know, the same owner. CBS owns the CW with uh, Warner Brothers, uh, but right now they're they're not playing particularly friendly. So, but I think that if this continues on the current path, uh, don't be surprised if Supergirl doesn't fly over to the CW what they're doing over there because they're actually starting to do something pretty special. Now, I'm wondering how much of the market, can, how much of the market, uh, how much of this the market can sustain. Because you have the Avengers, which I think, uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, which I think is on the brink of oversaturation as it is. And you have DC coming on board, which I think is going to really change people's tastes and what they want to see in comic book properties. Uh, and they're already doing it with when I, there's a, a situation on TV. And of course, the Defenders is coming down the line uh, on Netflix. And there's, to some degree, the CW might have beat Netflix to the punch, having this crossover world for the first time on the small screen. I mean, if Marvel tried to do it with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Agent Carter to some degree, but there was like a whole bunch of decades in between those shows, so they couldn't quite pull it off. Uh, but what they've done at the CW is really amazing. And the fact that the talent is willing to play along as well, uh, you saw both uh, Stephen Amell and uh, uh, Stephen, ah, I pronounced it correctly, Stephen Amell, Stephen Amell. Uh, I got it right yesterday in my story, and now it's left my mind again. But anyway, he's in he's in the Legends of Tomorrow trailer quite a bit, and so is the actor who plays the Flash. So the fact that all of these actors, uh, and Brandon, Brandon Ruth, by the way, what a way for him to come back after his horrible failure as Superman. Uh, now he's playing the Atom, and we'll talk about, about that in just a second. But to have them be so game, they're really almost like on a smaller like a lower but same uh, same situation as our actors who are signed on for these multiple movies on the big screen. So it's really fascinating to see this stuff take shape and I'm just wondering how big the appetite is for this kind of content from the mainstream audience. I think for those of us who are comic book fans, we can't get enough of it, but that's not enough to sustain these things. It might be enough to sustain the CW, but I don't know what this effect this might have on the movies. And speaking of having an effect on the movies, they have really introduced the Atom here in a big way, where Ant-Man, though, is coming to the screen in just uh, a couple of weeks, actually, very, very soon, a, a July release. Uh, but here you have Brandon Ruth, and special effects look pretty darn good. I mean, we'll see what Marvel offers in, this, in the big screen version, but at the end of the Legends of Tomorrow trailer, when he shrunk down and started to run, it was pretty close to what they're doing over at the Ant-Man movie. So very interesting indeed. And, you know, the comic book users are... are Fans are used to a lot of similarities between different properties, but I don't know how mainstream viewers are going to take to that. They're going to be like, is that Ant-Man? And someone's going to have to go, no, that's the Atom, 
well, what? how is he different from Ant-Man? Well, he's not really different that much at all, except, you know, Ant-Man currently is a thief, although the original Ant-Man was kind of more similar to the Atom. Uh, but this Atom, as they said on, in the trailer, he's like a billionaire developer, uh, but, you know, he also can shrink really small and has increased strength and stamina when he shrinks. But isn't that what Ant-Man does? You can just see this conversation going on for a very long time. They even kind of look the same, actually, although uh, Paul Rudd's a little bit older. But it's a inter very interesting dilemma, and we'll see how, it'll be interesting to see how mainstream audiences uh, deal with it. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story of the day has to do with another franchise. Franchises are all the rage these days. Everybody wants a franchise. Every studio needs a franchise. And they're digging through their closets, and they're like, man, we have to have some good stuff left in here. What can we, what can we dust off and put back out there? And one such franchise is Underworld, which is returning for a fifth entry, but in a very interesting way. And, uh, and it's making a pretty big headline in the way it's shaping up. So the, the big headline that got all the attention is that Kate Beckinsale is returning. And why not? She's got nothing else to do. And I think Kate Beckinsale, to her credit, is very good at action. Uh, she was one of the only good things about the Total Recall remake. Her action sequences were very well executed. So I'm not surprised that she's coming back. And Theo James is also returning. And he's in the Divergent films, but he doesn't get a lot of attention for being in the Divergent films. He's kind of like the Gale of uh, the Divergent films, you know, Gale from The Hunger Games, because I don't think um, Liam Hemsworth has gotten a lot out of that either. Uh, so he's going to return here. He's like, maybe this franchise will work for me. Maybe I was too quick to dismiss it. So they're going to return, and there's going to be a story about the new generation of vampires fighting werewolves, etc., etc. But that's not why the story is exciting. The story is exciting because they've signed out a female director to helm the uh, fifth installment, Anna Forster. And Anna Forster, listen to this, she cut her teeth as the second unit uh, director for Roland Emmerich. Now, a second unit for those of you who aren't aware, is uh, we'll go and get a lot of the action sequences. What happens is, is that a film needs to shoot in a finite period of time for budgetary reasons. You can't shoot forever. So since you only have a limited amount of time, there are two, there are different units working at the same time, right? So while Roland Emmerich might be shooting a close-up scene, like for instance, one of the films they worked on was The Day After Tomorrow. So maybe he's shooting like a shootout sequence, right? He's like, oh, let's do this big shootout sequence uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's do White House Down then. That works, that works better. And that's more current. White House Down. We're doing White House Down. So Channing Tatum and uh, Jamie Foxx are going to have a big action sequence with lots of, you know, shooting in the White House. But while that's happening, Anna Forster takes her second unit and goes in films like people running through the streets of Washington, D.C., uh, you know, as the terrorists storm the White House. So that's what, that's what a second unit does. So they can work in tandem and you can get a lot more done in a single day. So second, some people do, a second unit director is something where you can kind of move your way up to director eventually. Also kind of like cinematographer. Those are certain, you know, well-established paths to the director's chair. Not so much with second unit, but it can happen as is happening here. But Anna Forster didn't just jump right from second unit to directing Underworld 5. So she was Roland Emmerich's second unit director for a while, Day After Tomorrow, White House Down, those type of movies. But then she went to television, where a lot of directors are making a name for themselves, particularly female directors. So where is she? She's on the Outlander series on Stars, and that series is super hot. Uh, Stars finally got a major show for itself. I mean, this is kind of almost like a mini Game of Thrones. It's, that's what it's shaping up to be. It has a huge fan base, uh, really potent. And also, to their credit, Outlander itself is pushing very hard for fan appeal. They do major fan events. They are really reaching out to a lot of fan websites. I've se I haven't seen this kind of aggressiveness from a show to kind of will itself to be a fan favorite, I think, ever. Usually, you know, a show's a big hit, and then they field offers from different media media outlets and you know they're like you know like a king on a throne like I'll take you you and you and that's what happens but Outlander is like no hey guys have you seen what we're doing over here on stars it's kind of amazing here we'll give you a screener and they have fan events and also they have um there's a lot of there's a lot of sex on Outlander uh but apparently I don't watch Outlander just so you know full disclosure but apparently it's done from the female perspective so I've seen a lot of articles about that where they're like it was a sex scene but it was a sensuous thoughtful sex scene. Uh, so a lot of a lot of women and men are enjoying the show. So if I were a, a movie executive and someone said, well, who should we get for a director? And they, they said, well, what about Anna Forster? And I was like, what'd she do? And they said, well, she was the second unit director on uh, The Day After Tomorrow on White House Down. I'd be like, meh. And they're like, she's a director on Outlander. I'd be like, sold, because, you know, it has a female lead with Kate Beckinsale and in the Outlander fan base, I want them to come and watch my movie. So I think it's very, very smart 
to bring her on here. And I just think it's interesting that we're having like this, this is a good kind of explosion. We're having an explosion of diversity behind the camera. Uh, Antoine Fuqua is doing very well. Ryan Coogler is doing, of course, uh, from Fruitvale Station, the upcoming, uh, these are black directors, uh, the upcoming uh, Apollo, you know, the Creed movie for uh, Sylvester Stallone. So you see a lot of talent there. Uh, the Longest Ride, for instance, had a black director. Uh, Malcolm D. Lee's, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's more black film with Malcolm D. Lee uh, and uh, Best Man, the Best Man series. I'm talking about moving outside of that to just, you know, mainstream Hollywood, which is very important. So you have Antoine Fuqua, Ryan Coogler. So you have those directors moving forward. Uh, you have Asian directors like um, Justin Lin and James Wan doing quite well. John Chu, that's debatable. He just ruined Gem and the Hologram. So we'll see how long he stays around. But then uh, now also you see women getting on the board. Uh, you have not only uh, Anna Forster doing so well, Elizabeth Banks just crushed it with uh, Pitch Perfect 2, and Ava DuVernay is in discussions for Black Panther. If that deal goes through, that's going to be very exciting. And while we had kind of like the opening, you know, party, the exploratory party with uh, Angelina Jolie and Catherine Bigelow, they haven't really been able to go the distance. I think they were very important and credit should be given to them for breaking through the front line, but I think that this is the crop of female directors who I think are actually going to stick around and really make an impression. So we'll see. We'll see. It's very exciting times indeed to see all these barriers broken down, not just in front of the camera. I would almost wager that it's happening faster behind the camera. So that's really, really exciting. All right, so let's go to the viewer question of the day. This comes from Eskiwell, Maine. And Eskiwell should be very happy with today's episode because Eskiwell was also asking me all day yesterday to discuss the DC Legends of Tomorrow trailer. So Eskiwell, thank you for uh, caring what I think and your interest in my opinion. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on that. And now to your viewer question. So SQL says, Dear Grace, love watching morning movie news as part of my daily routine after school. I hope you had a great day. It was, it's Friday, it's the weekend coming up. So SQL says, I was wondering, with the new Star Wars universe being planned, uh, i.e. the six movies, do you think it would be a good idea to have a live action Star Wars TV show, possibly a sci-fi version of Game of Thrones set before all the prequels? Thanks again, Jack. Oh, great. Now I know uh, SQL Main's name. Thank you, Jack. Well, here's the thing. I think that this is a really difficult situation. I think that if they had not had uh, all the spin-offs that they're doing, this could have worked. But since Star Wars is expanding rapidly, exponentially, with not just a new trilogy, uh, but also all these different spin-offs and probably more spin-offs to come, and the animated shows that they're working on, I don't think that there's room anywhere else in the market for this kind of content. I think that they're going to go too far and people will be like, too much Star Wars. I think they even have a, they're even in danger of oversaturating it as is. Uh, I think everyone needs to be careful. Everyone should take a lesson from, you know, DreamWorks Animation that was like, why don't we release three movies a year? And realize that was a really bad business plan and that the animation audience could not sustain that kind of interest considering not just what DreamWorks was putting out, but everybody else. The key here isn't just what are you putting out, but what is everybody else putting out? And when it comes to genre genre storytelling, and that's not just superhero stuff, but all this stuff, uh, there's just so much because it's on TV, it's on uh, the big screen, it's on providers, streaming providers like Netflix. It's everywhere. And video games, by the way, in 2016 are about to join the fray in a major way. So very, very crowded. So I don't think there's any room for a Star Wars. I mean, I think Game of Thrones should be getting in on the movie business. I mean, forget going back the other way to television. Would a Star Wars show work? If maybe Star Wars decides to t temper what movies it's putting out, I think that it could work. I wouldn't make it, though, like before the prequels. I think they need to stop. I'm concerned with the time jumping in Star Wars. I think it's very difficult for audiences to follow. And I think they should just have like something that's happening on a far-off planet or something that's kind of related to the movies. Almost like what Marvel is doing with their Netflix initiative, right? Daredevil exists in the same universe as the Avengers at the same time, but it's just separate. And it's also the Netflix relationship allows Marvel to do something a little different, to go darker, a place that Kevin Feige has made clear they're not willing to go with their movies. So maybe they could have like a darker TV show. That would be interesting. But that's what the Rogue One spinoff has promised to be. So I don't see any real estate left for a TV show. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how Star Wars works out. Uh, Star Wars and DC, while a lot of us are very excited for them, are not yet proven. And even once you're out of the gate, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And Marvel is finding itself perhaps stumbling uh, as it comes into its third lap, a.k.a. Phase 3. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down you think, below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered on Monday, and any questions that you might have.
Thanks for watching. Bye.